So Alexander is chasing some units around, don't let him chase them too far away. Uh, you want to inflict just enough damage to them so they stay routed, because if an intact unit runs away, they will find their guts later on and they will come back to harass you later. So chase them just far enough to kill about half of them and then bring Alexander back to the main battle line. This is also the key reason that I disabled the uh, the general camera at the beginning of the scenario like I do at every scenario because Alexander is going to be so far behind enemy lines for most of this battle that you won't be able to move your camera onto the rest of your army otherwise. So while this is all going on, the Persian heavy cavalry, the Bactrians, have only just summoned the courage to actually attack us and not knowing what to do they attack us from the front. You should make pretty short work of them. Um, this whole time that it's been going on, uh, you've been shooting at them with your ranged units. Uh, and in this scenario, unlike the others, they're actually pretty damn useful because your army is on the defensive. Uh, your javelineers, your archers, they have lots of killing power here because the enemy spends so much time milling around in front of your line. You get lots of shots off. I recommend using fire arrows uh, when the infantry approach because, well, fire arrows are scary. Um, the key to winning this is morale, of course, because if you can't break the units quickly enough, they will pile up and they'll overwhelm you. Once we've finished bringing down the last of their cavalry, the Persian army no longer has the initiative. At this point, it boils down to micromanagement. Just don't get too confident when you see two units coming at you at a time. The enemy units are bigger than yours. By that, I mean our phalanxes have 60 men per unit, theirs have 200. It's kind of crappy that, in scaling down the armies to keep the 3 to 1 odds, the developers gave the Persians the biggest single army possible and then made ours a third as big. This is fixed in the next scenario, however, by giving the Macedonians the biggest possible army and giving the Persians three armies. But we'll get to that when it comes, which is the Battle of Gargamela. When it comes up next, which is awesome, by the way. Back on subject, on the subject of historical battles, which aren't this one, you guys have probably noticed another thing that sets Alexander apart from the rest of the Total War franchise. In the historical battles here, you're actually on the winning side every time. There's still a challenge in being a winner in this case precisely because of the stupendous odds that Alexander faced during his campaign. That's not really so in most of the battles in history. The winners are often obvious before the battle has even been fought. The Total War way of adding challenge to these historical battles is trying to ch is in trying to change it. That is to say, uh, winning a historically unwinnable battle. It's no fun knowing that the odds are actually in your favor and that your side actually historically won. Uh, I mean, except in the case of Alexander Total War. And I've actually got the perfect example for that. In Medieval 2 Total War, do you guys remember the Battle of Agincourt? where you're on the side of the English, you can actually, well, you can literally win that scenario by loading it up and not touching any of the controls. It would have been more fun to be the French army, really, and have to brave the storm of pikes and mud and arrows from the Welsh longbowmen. But anyways, the most fun from games that you're going to get that try to jam history down your throat is seeing how badly you can screw up history, really. I guess that's why I like Paradox games so much, but good luck making a video Let's Play for Victoria. At this point, winning the battle basically boils down to micromanagement. You are attacked by a few really powerful units at a time. I know, it doesn't make much sense to me either. I think what the developers intended to happen was that the Persian army is scripted to stay where it is until Darius is broken or killed, and then that scripted lock is broken and the units can assume their regular behavior which should be running away or whatever, but the script doesn't seem to release control over the Persian army all at once. Or maybe the scripting was written with the assumption that all the fighting would be taking place on the other side of the river, that the Greek army would be the one on the offensive. Uh, I've tried playing the scenario that way, uh, it was the first thing I tried when I first played this a long time ago, and it's unwinnable if you do that, so I don't really know how the developers intended on this scenario to play out. Maybe it just 
wasn't playtested very well. Maybe that has something to do with the fact that you can only play these scenarios in sequence. You can't play a scenario until you've beaten the one before it. Maybe it's kind of like Battletoads in that uh, the playtesters couldn't get past the previous battle. Who knows? I'm going to fast forward here because the next few minutes are boring and I don't want to lose you guys. Once you've kicked the enemy around enough to make it reevaluate its tactical situation, the Persians will fall back to their side of the river. On normal difficulty, they do this when the balance of forces has become evenly matched, as gauged by the blue red bar next to the minimap on the interface. It's up to you to take the fight to them at this point. If you want to be cautious, take a few minutes to let your men rest because superior morale is your best advantage in this scenario. You should have plenty of room to do the old hammer and si um, hammer and anvil. That is, uh, hold the enemy in place and tire them out with your phalanxes, then smash them with your cavalry and medium infantry. It works every time when done properly. Uh, I guess the hammer and sickle approach would be what the Persians would be doing this whole campaign. A human wave of poorly trained and equipped men. That's Red Army Tactics, or uh, Lime Green Army Tactics. The Resistance should be pretty disorganized at this point. They can't make up their mind whether they want to go after you, that is Alexander, or if they want to make a stand in a defensible position, so... They do what the AI usually does, and that is split their forces up in this case, it was completely unintentional on my part, but if you're doing it deliberately, if you're being really clever and strategic about it, you can disperse the Persians like a WTO protest. So I got some final comments now that I'm wrapping up. Overall, I'm pretty glad with how this particular playthrough turned out, but one thing I could have done better was my phalanx organization. And this was an issue that only jumped out at me when I went back to the recording and started doing the narration. You'll notice my phalanxes are actually pretty poorly organized when they attack the enemy. And that's because I didn't give them enough time and space to do it properly. The thing is, even if a phalanx is well ordered and stationary, as soon as you give it an order to attack, it will have to reorient itself so that it's facing the right direction, then it can march towards the bad guys. And to do that, it has to break and reform the phalanx. If you order them to attack an enemy that's too close by, your phalanx will be a confused rabble of pikes and greeks by the time that they make contact with the enemy, and that leads to unnecessary casualties. Give them enough space so that it takes the phalanx about 10 seconds or so to reach the enemy, and by the time they get there, it'll be a perfectly ordered killing machine. What I think is funny about this is that the phalanx is the slowest unit in the game, right? But it shares this property of needing, you know, run-up space with cavalry, which is the fastest unit, because they also need plenty of room to reorganize and accelerate in order to charge properly. So, I guess, the uh, to boil it down, to put it in a nutshell, the best way to handle a phalanx is to treat it, not that it's attacking enemies, but really, really slowly charging them. The enemy army is in flight! Pers the enemy are utterly beaten! This is a crushing victory worthy of a great general! Very nice, but before you give me too much credit here, remember that any victory is going to be a heroic victory, at least against these kinds of odds. Well, thanks for watching everybody, I'll see you next time.